Hello, everybody. My name is Manny. Welcome to our first ever interview with the 3D Masters. We're really excited to have Raphael Grissetti as our first honorary uh, interview with the Masters uh, presenter. So uh, thank you so much for taking this time to kind of share with us your process and your workflow. Um, before we begin, I'd like to just make a couple of announcements. Uh, so we're going to have the, the uh, 2D program is going to be registration for, I should say, registration for the winter term, or summer, um, so sorry, spring term for CGMA 2D Academy uh, will begin in the next three weeks. So definitely check out uh, the website and go to 2d.cgmasteracademy.com uh, to pre-register for some of the classes. Um, we have an amazing lineup of instructors for this new term, as well as some of the new classes um, that we're going to be featuring as well. So, and registration for the 3D Academy will open on April the 7th, so definitely uh, register for your spots in advance. Um, we're really excited to have an amazing lineup of instructors as well as advisors helping really shape this overall program. This is something we've been working on for quite some time and really excited about it. Um, so without further ado, um, I give you Raphael. Hey, hey, Manny, thanks. <laughs> great, it's so, great. To, it's great to have you, Raph. And let me share. Yeah. Let me share your screen now. Give me a second. Yeah. Right, if you, if you want to just say, like, people can ask questions on the on the chat and everything. Yes. And I'm, and I'm just gonna go through a couple of images, just showing my pipeline. And uh, we're gonna talk about stuff that I use on my own personal projects, stuff that I use at work. So any questions Perfect. about that, I'll be I'll be happy to answer. Yes, guys. So um, as Raphael mentioned, this is something I should have mentioned earlier. So if you have any questions um, for Raphael throughout this presentation, just feel free to add those to the uh, the questions module that you have um, in your little uh, go to meeting panel. Um, so what's going to happen is Raphael is just going to go over his workflow for how he creates his amazing characters for about 15, 20 minutes or so. And then after that, we'll take uh, questions. Okay, so uh, Raph, it's all yours. All right, sounds good. So basically, let, let me just get to some. All right. So I'm just gonna show like you, seen, you guys seen the raptor character, and there's something that I I did on my on my own time, a personal but like a personal project, uh, and it was based on a cat on a on a concept from from I think it's a ch Chinese guy, and a lot of people ask about that, like why do I pick up concepts or, or why do I don't create characters or like my own designs and ideas, and I really like to just, most of the time, just use a, a concept that already exists, because that's pretty much what you're going to do on like a, in a professional job, like it's really hard for you, except if you work as a designer, but if you work as a character artist in a game studio or in a cinematic studio and everything, you, you're always going to have a concept from, from a concept artist, so just being able to show that you can, like, then you can use the concept and just make it better, or you can just get the vision from from another artist and just make it on your own 3D character of it. So this one right here, I started using Dynamesh, and that's another question I usually get: like, why if I use Dynamesh or if I just go and model something in Max, or and it doesn't really matter. Like, it really depends on the project. If it's a creature, I usually just go with Dynamesh and. I mean, just have fun in ZBrush, yeah, keep, keep playing with the shapes, because it doesn't really matter the topology at that point. I'm just trying to just figure out all the shapes and, and just have a better idea of how the character is supposed to look. So in here, you can see I just started from, from a sphere in ZBrush. I was just pushing and pulling and using Dynamesh just to get the overall shape. And you can see just playing with Dynamesh, just keep adding the shapes. And then this was before ZBrush released the Z remesher. That was the like before that we had to do like just guidelines so ZBrush can create the topology on top of that. And that's another thing. I don't really use that professional like professionally. Usually I just do like a grid, like grid topology in Max or or Topogun or, or any other software. I don't use Z remesher at work because when you when you're working for a game 
you've got to have like a nice, nice flow, a nice topology, and got to have more control. ZBrush is awesome to give you a good base with the with the new Zero Mesher, but it's very hard when you when you want something specific. So this is just for personal project. Just, just want to make it clear that that's for, like, I use that for personal projects because the topology doesn't really matter. So now you can see here that I have like a final topology, and I created. If you guys can see, I have three layers, one with the mouth open, one with the mouth closed, and the third one is the secondary shapes. And on this layer, I was gonna, I'm going to keep modeling the character, keep tweaking and everything, but I, I have those two, two layers that control the mouth open and mouth closed, and I'm not going to touch those. So every, every tweak that I do on the, on the third layer is going to propagate to all those layers, so I can still work with the mouth open and I keep adding details and you know what I mean. And then here's just I keep working, adding details and about the, the brushes that I use, I don't really go too crazy with the alphas and stuff. At that at this point it's mostly damn standard that I'm using. Damn standard and, and the standard brush, inflate, all those basic brushes. You see just keep adding detail adding details. So you can see here just the amount of work that I'm doing at this point. I'm not worrying about the, the small details. I'm really going through the overall shapes and then just keep moving forward. So here I'm just blocking out the body and you can see it's a different subtool. I'm just cutting whatever I think it's not gonna show. And I do it, this a lot with the characters because this way I have I don't have like a poly count limitation because ZBrush can go over the ZBrush can go over the poly count real quick, so I can I just split as much as I can into subtools, and then at the end I can just merge everything into one piece. So again, just keep tweaking, adding another subtool, trying to find the shapes of the legs. And now, so again. You can see the difference, because before I just had like a, I just blocked out the shapes without worrying too much about details and and everything. Just trying to find the overall proportions and everything, and then I'm gonna come here and just keep refining the piece. Same thing here, so you can see on the chest, really popping out those details. And again, I'm not worrying about the the third chair shape, the details, like the small wrinkles and everything. I'm just looking at the overall forms and, and, and shapes. Again, same thing for the legs. So you can see here that I have, before I had like a, the rough idea of what I wanted, and then I'm just coming in and refining. So now you can see like the mouth open and mouth closed, just both layers and the details still there. Same thing for the legs. Tweaking proportions, adding details. So you can see here that's the final model and again I don't have a lot of details like alpha details on this model and that's another thing I do at work. I don't I don't do everything in ZBrush. And again ZBrush, like I always say, it's not my main main tool. I use Max and I use Photoshop and everything else just to like work together. When I, I see a lot of people just going and going all the way ZBrush and at work I would say ZBrush is kinda maybe like 40 percent of my pipeline. I don't use a lot of ZBrush at work. So in here I'm just gonna show how I handle the details. From from from, from at this point I was I opened the, the UVs of the character and I started texturing, so you can see here how I split the subtools and how I'm going to handle the UVs. So every single piece has its own UV set. And I'm going to start texturing and then I'm going to use the texture just to add more, de add more detail to the piece. I don't have to go to ZBrush and go crazy and, and just put as much details as I, as I can. I can work with the textures at the same time and get the same level without worrying too much about alphas and everything. So here, it's just how I handle the texture for this guy. I basically made like a base poly paint in ZBrush. So you can see it's just base colors in ZBrush. 
and I use a lot of the spray the spray mold with the brushes just to get that the kind of, of the break like 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 it's an airbrush and then with this base color I can go in Photoshop since I have the UVs for this I go into Photoshop and I just keep adding a lot of photo reference on top of the of the of the of the color so I can get a lot of detail and a lot of realistic details on top of this base color that I painted in ZBrush. So you can see here how the model looks with the textures on, with a lot of photo and dirt from 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 photos. So you can see the textures that are used. Same thing for the body. So this was base painted in ZBrush. And then I can export this base color, go to Photoshop, and just apply it a bunch of a bunch of images on top of that, and just get a lot of details. On top of that, I exported a cavity map and exported the normal map from from this, and I can use the normal map just to get all those cracks and just to pop out the details. So this is a flat color, but you can still see all the shapes in the texture. So that's before with only the poly paint, and that's after with all those textures applied, all those those images applied into the base color. And you can see here a little bit of the, the textures that I used. So it's all marble just to get those small details. Like I was saying, I don't do everything into ZBrush because there's a lot of there's a polycount limitation that you can you can get enough of you can get maybe you're not gonna have enough resolution just to project all those tex textures in ZBrush. So I use UVs and I use Photoshop just to get as much details as I, as I want on the textures. So you can see here the marble and the, the crack holes and the metals just to get like a dirt, kind of break the shapes, break the, break the colors. Same thing for the arms. So you can see here it's kind of popping out all those shapes because of the normal map that I'm putting on top of the diffuse. So just by having UVs on your character, it helps a lot when you want to do something outside of ZBrush and then bring it back. So I try to be as much organized as I can, even with personal projects. So you can see in the legs, same thing. So basically I spray brush in ZBrush, like an airbrush piece, and then I exported the base color into Photoshop, applied all those textures, all those images, just to get all the shapes to pop out. On top of that, I'm doing a lot of hand painting in, Z in Photoshop, so kind of those edges, just to pop out those, those edges. Same thing for here, like you can see the white lines in each of those spikes. And then for posing, that's another thing. ZBrush has the Transpose Master and in my experience, it just crashes a lot, so uh, most of the times I just pose it by hand. So I just mask the model and, and rotate and everything. It's kind of, if you have a low res in your ZBrush, it's kind of easy to do that without worrying about the Transpose Master or any other software. Just basically pose it by hand by masking and, and rotating. So you can see here just the textures, and again, just the attention to the details. It, it really it really sells the piece. I mean, if you can see here, I got all those small spots that kind of break the color of the model. Same thing for, for the shoulder. You can see like this, the color is kind of bleeding into the shoulder pad, and that gives a nice effect. So just by having that attention to details, it really helps. To, at the end, when you're going to render, you're going to have all everything popping out. The same thing for the mouth, like all the cavity map that I got from ZBrush and from the normals. By applying that into my diffuse, this is a flat color, so you can still see all the shapes and everything. And then, like, especially because I do a lot of renders inside of ZBrush, this way I don't have to like to worry about the shader. I'm still gonna have all my shapes and everything into my base color, so the shaders are gonna be important, but the texture itself is more important than the shaders. Here you can see the UVs. And this was was done inside of ZBrush with the UV master, which is pretty easy to use. And if you if you're doing a personal project or even if it's something that the UVs are not really important, you can still use ZBrush. But again, in my my professional 
uh, workplace, I do the UVs in Max or uh, I do my UVs in Max or Maya. This way, you have more control of the UVs. So you're gonna just the use of the use of space, the the seam lines, everything is very specific. So you you gotta be able to know how to use those softwares. But again, this is a personal project, so it doesn't really matter. I just wanna to have the UV so I can paint in Photoshop and be able to come back and forth. So you can see here the final piece. Oops. Let me go back. No. Yeah, so you can see here the final piece. And again, the render was done inside of ZBrush, and I'm gonna go to that real quick so we can talk about how I export the layers, how I think about the scene and everything. And for this guy, and usually on my, my projects, I do a lot of tests in the middle of the process, like when I'm modeling the face, I do a lot of render tests just to get an idea of, of what's going to work and what's not going to work. And this way, I can, at the end, because if you just leave to do the render at the end, and especially in ZBrush, it's really hard to get like a final image. You have to export a bunch of of layers and render passes and everything. And if you leave to do that at the end and it's not good enough, you're not going to you're not going to do another render just to test it. So by testing during the process, I'm, I'm kind of have I kind of have an idea of what's going to work at the end. So on this guy, I had a couple references of of statues and usually how people like the statues and to get a nice like real like realistic feel to it. So from this guy, what I did is just exp let me try to open the the render scene real quick so we can go through that. But you can see the layers that I have. Just give me one sec. Uh, okay. So you can see here the layers, uh, which you, I hope it makes sense. All right. Get rid of this mask. Okay, so so this is a base render from ZBrush, from yeah, from ZBrush uh, with the BPR render, and basically what I'm what I try to do inside of ZBrush is kind of replicate what we have on other softwares. So basically, you have like a global illumination, and you have some direct lights. So the direct lights is easy to do in ZBrush. You just basically just press render and you got a, a light. So this is a this is the this is my main light coming from from this from the right. And then I got a backlight coming from the opposite side. Which is later I just change the color in Zebra in Photoshop. And ZBrush is a white render, same thing as this one, but coming from the back and then in Photoshop I change it to a blue or, or green or whatever I want. And here, this is just level correction to that back to the backlight layer, just kind of changing the levels and really just making it stronger and everything. So, again, I, I leave it most of the work to Photoshop and my ZBrush. My all my base renders are pretty like normal. There's no, there's no. I don't change a lot of set, settings or, or anything like that. So, and then Photoshop, I can just make it stronger, change the change the color. So you can see here, it's changing to like a blue color, and then that's the hue saturation, then the levels, just make it stronger. And then what I, ha what I do to just kind of replicate the, the global illumination inside of ZBrush, I do a lot of bounce lights, just kind of bring back the shapes and like, for those who use renders and uh, global illumination just, it, it, it is light coming from all the, all the angles, so I just create a lot of lights and like old school when you have to create like that dome of lights just to have the global illumination. So here's my first bounce light, and this is just a, a light coming from, from the camera. Let's see if I can get that. So it's, it's really a light coming from the, the center of the, the image. And again, just bring you back some of those shadows, and those, you can see here the strong shadow before and after. It's kind of getting everything more even. This is my first spec map. And again, I do this with the reflection shader in, in ZBrush, which is a pretty 
standard uh, is standard shader, so it's this guy right here, the reflected map. This is the shader that I use mostly to do specs. So I can render this shader and export and just export the image and then in Photoshop I use it as a screen mode. So this, this shader right here is a screen mode in Photoshop. And again, with a mask just for the areas that I want, so this is going to be more shiny and wet. So that's my first spec map. This is again another bounce light, and for this I'm using a matte cap. And for those who use ZBrush, it's going to make more sense, but if you don't use it, just don't worry. It's going to make sense when you start using it. So here's my first matte cap, and I just, again, I just use it very subtle as a, as a normal, just again, just to bring some of the shapes back. And by doing that, just adding more and more layers, I keep kind of getting away from that ZBrush look that most of the renders when like, Auto ZBrush had. So just adding those layers just keep getting more and more away and just keep getting like a more GI effect to it. And again, another bounce light. And this one is coming from, from kind of the center, but a little bit different from the other one. And again, just bringing all those shapes back. And then I have here another spec map. And that's another thing. In, a, in another software, for example, Keyshot or V-Ray, the spec is actually coming from your environment. So you're going to have a spec everywhere. And that's what I'm trying to replicate inside of ZBrush. I just have a lot of spec passes with the lights changing and a bunch of directions. And by adding those specs and by adding more and more, I just keep adding the global illumination feel to the image. So here's my first spec, my second spec map. Here's another one. And this one's coming from the top. And you can really see like the light like the shapes coming, coming out, and it doesn't look, it doesn't look a lot, it doesn't look flat anymore. It's just you get a lot of spec coming from the top. And then I have an SSS pass, and this is just coming as a standard from ZBrush. There's nothing fancy about that, and I'm using as a lighten mode. And again, I'm tweaking the color just to make it red, and I'm using, and I have a mask just to mask wherever I want it to be. You can see here, or mostly on the theme parts. And then what I have here is just a final backlight, just to bring that backlight back. It's the same coming from the back. So you can see everything is very subtle. I mean, when I see a lot of renders from ZBrush, everything is really strong, and you have the, the, e the usual blue and red backlights, and you know, stuff that we learn when we are starting to learn lighting. And by doing this and just having everything very subtle and just picking a main source of light and having a backlight, it just it helps create a more realistic kind of environment and, and lighting setup. So I hope it makes sense. There's nothing really fancy about this. I think it's it looks really amazing. Playing the lights, thanks man. Looks and great. I, at, the, at the end I have an ambient occlusion just to kind of sucking those shapes, and then background is a light background. And then I have just a back background for a second, second image. So if I come back to those images now, let's see here. If I'm going, I think I'm going way too fast, but anyway. I hope it makes sense. I, I think I think it makes sense, and and we we it's a uh, once as you're wrapping this up, it's like we do have some questions, but I think so far, for a lot of the students, it's like you know who as you mentioned, use ZBrush, it, it should make sense, but the overall process, mm -hmm. I think it's just great to be able to see how you work and what you're thinking about. Cool. Yeah. So so here you can see those those passes, those render passes that I'm talking about. So you can see the main light coming from from the right of the screen. And then I have the, that first backlight, and then I have the first bounce light, which is coming from the from the center of the image, so I can get rid of all those shadows and just adding more environment. As the this is the, the matte cap, and you can find this matte cap on the Pixelogic website. They have a bunch of matte caps over there. There's the first matte cap. That's the occlusion pass. That's that's the SSS. 
reflection or specular. There's the first spec, second spec, so you can see the difference from the specs and trying to get all those shapes again just to pop up. And this is just another angle, same process, another angle, same thing. And again, just just by clear, just talking about a little bit about how I present the models, like it's really good. Like when you when you want to work as a character artist, just really don't worry about the final final image. Just worry about showing your character, because I see a lot of people just put like a crazy background and just put him on a, on a crazy environment or or in a crazy lights, just make it more dramatic. But if you want to work as a character artist, it really doesn't matter. Like what matters, it's if you can actually deliver the character. So just by doing like a simple, simple, simple lighting setup, of course you have to show the model the best way possible, but just doing a simple lighting setup and just by showing that the model is working and nothing gets, uh, nothing gets away from, from the lighting because you can have like, you can have like a very dramatic lighting and maybe, maybe something is not working but you don't actually see it and just by showing that everything is working, it's really important when someone is actually looking at your portfolio and says like, oh, this guy really can model and can, like this, I can put in the game and it's going to be fine. So yeah, this guy can de deliver the job instead of having like a guy who has like a bunch of realistic renders and the character looks good, but like we can't use this. So just keep that in mind, if you, especially if you want to work in a game studio, just show your character the best way you can and make sure it's visible to everybody that you can actually deliver the job. Oops. Oh, I hate when I do that. Let me just go back. All right. So, yeah, that's a completely different character, but we can maybe talk about that. But if you yeah, want to definitely. go through some questions. So, yeah, let's, let's go into uh, some questions, Raph. The first one is from um, Felipe Silva, who asks, uh, um, do you prefer to use Dynamesh with 128 or more, and if so, how much? Does that does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. I mean, Dynamesh for me is just it's mainly a sketch tool, so I don't go crazy with the resolution of the Dynamesh. It's really for blocking out the base mesh, as we used to do in Max or, or any other software. So I use Dynamesh in a very low settings, 128, 128. Maybe it's it's a little low, but I don't go a lot over that. I just really try to get all the shapes and then just make just basically creating a base mesh and then I do some zero mesher on top of the of the dynamesh. So when I start sculpting the character, I have a good topology and because the problem with dynamesh, it it creates a lot of triangles in your mesh. So if you start sculpting from dynamesh, you're gonna have issues at the end when you want to add small details or when you want to just smooth your mesh or do something more technical on your mesh, so I try not to go crazy with the with the resolution and then at the end I use zero mesh and I start sculpt this, adding subdivisions on that mesh and start sculpting from that. I don't use that mesh on a high res number. That Which yeah that uh, that does and, and it kinda leads into the next question um, from Julie uh, Shah. Um, how can you control the t uh, topology in ZBrush without going overboard? Would would building the mesh in another program, such as Maya um, or Max, be a solution to that? Yeah, for sure. I don't. I don't do a lot of topology inside of ZBrush. Just, I mean, I use a lot when I'm doing personal works because it doesn't really matter, and it's really hard to control. Like you said, it's 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 basically you press. A, you you have some some tools that helps you have more control, but it's really it's not very good. So I use Max. I use Topogun, I use Maya, I use all those softwares, those base softwares to just do a clean topology and do a clean model and then I come back to ZBrush just to finish sculpting and export the maps and everything. But yeah. So ZBrush is for sketching and then other software is just to create a clean topology and then ZBrush, come back to ZBrush just to finish it. No, I think that makes complete sense. Um, we have another question from um, Martino. Uh, who asked, before you work in ZBrush, do you actually make sketches with pencil on paper um, or anything like that? 
I don't do that. I have a lot of friends that can do that and it's really helpful. I just don't, I don't, I don't have, I mean, I, I'm not a good concept artist. I'm not, I don't draw that much. So for me, it's hard to do some sketches or when I, when I have to do something and uh, I have a lot of times that I had to do that, I just go to clay and I, like if I'm making a character and I want to maybe explore more the vision of, with the director, with the art director in the studio, I have a piece of clay and I can sculpt like something real quick just so he can have an idea of that's, if that's going to work and how it's a silhouette and everything. I don't draw a lot. I think for me it's easier to just go straight from ZBrush and just play with DynaMesh and maybe do those sketches inside of ZBrush instead of drawing. But I have a lot of friends that do that and it's, it's very helpful. Yeah, I think, it, I think it, it, at the end it depends on what your workflow is, right? Some people are more comfortable with drawing something or sketching something out. It's like in 2D and other people are just more comfortable in 3D. So I think it's based on your preference yeah, as well. So uh, we have another question from Carlos uh, Rivera who asks, um, how long uh, does it take you to complete a model? And obviously, it's like I would imagine pr doing something professionally versus doing something yeah. as a personal work would vary. But you know, let's say let's just ask that as it relates to both instances, professionally yeah. and personally. Yeah, and really, I try to be. I try to be very smart about my time and everything. So, uh, uh, personal projects, I try to handle that as much as I would do professionally. So I have like a, a schedule for my personal projects. I try not to go over time because I know if you just keep working on the, on the personal project, it can go like over a year or like many, many months just by tweaking it. And sometimes you just don't have time and then you come back. So I try to have a schedule based on my professional experience for my personal projects. And I try not to go over that too much. So for usually when you, when you were in the studio, you have from it depends on the character, but you have like maybe one month, one month, six weeks for, for a character, for a full character. And that's, again, it really depends, but that's overall the amount of time that you get. And I try to do that for my personal project. So, it, for example, if I'm, if I'm starting to work on that Raptor, and I just try to handle like how, how much time I would need to do this in a workplace or in a freelance or for a client, and let's say for that character it was about four weeks and let's say I think four weeks is enough and so I give myself four weeks of, of time to do even for personal projects and then I do as much as I can to get that done in four weeks even if I'm not getting paid to do it. <laughs> Which makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And, I, and it's, just, it's just good to have that kind of commitment to your, your own stuff because it's you can again your, your your portfolio is really what matters, and you have you need to have enough material on your personal pro on your personal or professional portfolio. So if you just try to be more efficient with your time and then kind of get those schedules, it just just works better for me. No, definitely. Um, so we have another question here um, from Hector, uh, who asks, "I have a good uh, topple on a model in Maya. It's a hard surface model." What's the best way to give it details in ZBrush and transfer it into Maya without losing the topo? Say again. Um, so his question is, he has a, a hard surface model in Maya, and the yeah. topology is already laid out. Oh. Um, what is the best way for him to add those details into ZBrush um, and transfer it back into Maya without losing the topology? So for, for hard surface stuff, let, let me maybe show this character so you can have an idea of, because the thing is when you're working with hard surface, I do a lot of stuff in Max and, and in Max basically, I, I don't use a lot of ZBrush for hard surface. I do, for example, in this character, pretty much everything you see is Max. There's not a lot of ZBrush in this. Maybe like... I try to add like just small details. So, for example, on this guy, everything here you see it's max, but like those small lines, like this line right here, it's ZBrush. This piece right here, it's ZBrush. So I kind of try to have a mix from Max and ZBrush, and I leave most of the job to Max. I don't like to do hard surfacing in ZBrush. 
I don't think it. I don't think it looks good. I don't think it's uh, really when you're working up in a production and, and you gotta be able to reuse those assets. And if you do hard surfacing in ZBrush, it's really hard to reuse some of those pieces. And from here, I can easily tweak this if I want. Or since the topology is clean inside of Max, I can easily tweak and change the asset if 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 I need to. And it's easy to reuse if I'm doing like a I don't know. For example, in Mass Effect, we had to build like a, a lot of armors and we had to do a lot of guns. And for a gun, for example, like a full rifle, like a sci-fi rifle, you have a week to model, do the in-game makes, textures, and everything. So the time is really short. So you gotta be able to reuse a bunch of stuff. So by by having those pieces, make it like those pieces with a clean topology, you can re easily just change it or tweak it or reuse for something else. That's one of the reasons I don't do hard surfacing in ZBrush. But when I had to, for example, this guy, if I would export it from from ZBrush to Maya, if it's a, if it's for a production, if, a, if it's for a cinematic, for example, I wouldn't do this in ZBrush. I would just model everything in Max because I know it's going to read better and I know for, for hard surface stuff, it's going to just work better at the end. So. Again, I don't do a lot. I don't export a lot of details from ZBrush to Maya or Max when I'm talking about, when I'm talking about hard surface and stuff, because it's really hard to translate the best. Like the same look that you have in ZBrush, it's not going to look the same in Maya when you're doing hard yeah. surface. Yeah, I think it's just a, a completely different workflow for some people. Yeah. So yeah, cool. Um, I have another question from uh, Michael. About the texturing and colors, what do you think about the new software called Substance Painter? I think it's great. I mean, we use we use Mari at the at work, and I guess it does kind of the same thing. You kind of have like a specific shaders you can paint directly on top of the model, and I guess that's that's kind of the future. I mean, Photoshop it's pretty good, but just being able to paint directly on your model it just helps. It just makes everything easier and by and they have some crazy brushes in there so yeah we we all we all we're all starting to use a lot, a lot of studios are just changing the workflow to start using those softwares so yeah it's the future and it's, re, it's very good I, I have used it myself and it's, it's great cool um, I think you, you, you partly um, partially answered this question um, but Ryan asked how long does it take to create a character for a triple A game about it depends again yeah. Like for a face, we usually have like maybe two weeks, and then for the body, it goes from four weeks to, I don't know, eight weeks. But again, if you're in a game studio, and for example, you work on the main character, and there's a lot of tweaks, and then the, the art director changes his mind, and then there's a lot of stuff happening, and a lot of things can go wrong and at the same time. So, for example, as a character, a main character of, the, of a game, people can work on it for eight months or for a year in the same character. And maybe a secondary character, which is not that important, and the concept is is done. You can have maybe four weeks or maybe six weeks. So it, it depends. Mm -hmm. I think the overall it's like from four to eight weeks for a full character. Yeah, for a full character. Cool. Um, Jason asks, do you prefer to work on flat UVs, or do you uh, do you do some painting in Mari or another uh, 3D painting software? Um, I, I think you already partially yeah. asked, um, asked this before, but do you rather you like working on just flat UVs in Photoshop, flat textures in Photoshop? Do you prefer in 3D? Yeah, uh, I, I work like mainly with flat UVs in Photoshop. That's my main tool, and that's how I use for for many years. And the reason I do that is because I can just do a lot of projection based. Because for example, I can export the normal map. If I'm working for a game, I can export the normal map, and by using Crazy Bump or using any of those softwares that convert convert the normal map into uh, like high maps and, and different different passes that you can get from your normal map, I can easily just apply that into Photoshop. So by having flat UVs, I can just use my normal map or displacement or cavity map or anything that I export from ZBrush, I can easily just place on top of in Photoshop like I showed with the, with the Raptor character. I have a base color in ZBrush and then Basically, everything else is done with the flat UVs in Photoshop. I'm I'm now starting to use Mari to do some more specific stuff. So when you I don't know maybe when you just texturing a, 
a naked character, for example, and you have like a bunch of UV sets. The thing about Mari, I think you can use as much UV sets as you as you want. So, for example, if you have a character that has like six UVs, like one UV is for the arm, one UV sets for the body, one UV sets for the legs, and we we do that a lot in the games. So, we, so you can reuse those those arms for different characters. For example, let's say a hero character is gonna have like five different arms or five different torso variations. So you can you can have a like a lot of U sets into one character. So Mario is very good because you can just paint directly on top of your model without worrying about UV sets or, or anything like that. So we're starting to use more and more Mari because it's it is mainly a Photoshop. It looks a lot of like Photoshop. You have all those layers, all those effects, all those, everything in you have in Photoshop but you have in, in Mari and you can top you can paint on top of your model and have as many UV sets as you want. So yeah. Cool. I mainly use flat UVs but I'm, I'm starting to migrate to Mari. To Mari, great. Uh, do you prefer to uh, do you prefer sculpting details in ZBrush or do you make edits to the normal map and texturing like with Endo or uh, Dido or Endo or Dido? Yeah, I, I do both things. I try to do like like a show director. I do what's enough in ZBrush. I don't go crazy. Like if I can just add, for example, I don't know, if I'm doing a face. And I know I can just add like a pass. I have a good UVs and I can add a pass of poor maps later in the main my texture. I can I just do enough in ZBrush and then I do all the rest in my texture. So I yeah, I try to be very I can, I try to optimize my time and don't wait don't waste a lot of time into ZBrush and so yeah, I use a lot of endo all the, all that stuff. Okay, cool. And so the next question we have is uh, for the Diablo fan art piece, um, I've always been curious to know if the glows are primarily texture based or if it was achieved through lighting in Photoshop. I have a I had a glow glow map to that. So okay, it, it so was that was a glow. Yeah, because that that was an in-game character in my set, and yeah, that was a it was kind of like a, a mix between a glow map and I had a lot of lighting baked on my diffuse just to get some of the Maybe I have this here. Yeah, so it was it was both things. I was doing I was doing a lot of diffuse bake baked lighting, and I was doing some glow maps on top of that. So, for example, this light right here on the horn, that's all coming from from the the glow map and the bake in the diffuse. So it's kind of a mix of of techniques. It's not only one thing, not only the other. It was, it was a mix. It was a mix. Okay, cool. So uh, we have another question here from a fellow Brazilian. <laughs> and he asks, uh, um, as many of your international audience here, uh, it would be awesome to hear a little bit about you, your professional experience, and uh, what did you get in terms of knowledge um, and maybe some tips on what not to do and what to do as it relates to breaking into this business. Sure. Can I answer that in Portuguese or do I have to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think uh, in English you'll probably be better just because of time. <laughs> no, yeah, I started in Brazil maybe like uh, eight years ago, ten years ago. Yeah, so ten years ago I started working at, with advertising and all that stuff in, like, in Brazil. And then I spent uh, three years doing that and then I just worked as a freelance. Because uh, in those three years I was working as an animator. I was basically doing everything, animation, rigging, uh, modeling, rendering, all that stuff. And then at that time I just I make I made my own portfolio focused on characters and ZBrush. And it, after those three years I started working as a freelancer just for characters. So I spent two years doing that before I moved to Canada. And again, just like you said, just by experience, I really recommend for people that are starting on this business and in Really want to work. I don't know as a character artist in the game, in the game industry. Just just try to get as much as experience as you can. I mean, if you if you if you can work it with advertising, just go do that because you're gonna learn a lot of stuff. And I learned it, a lot of stuff. So that that was really my school back in Brazil because I didn't go to school. Or I didn't do any of that. That's really that was really my school at that time. And I learned 
just to all the pipeline. I learned how to animate, I, I learned how to do rigging, rendering, and I was working with some really great people and they, that showed me a lot of stuff. So I learned a lot of pop, up, about pipelines and stuff. And then when I moved to Canada, I was to work at Bioware. I worked on Mass Effect series and I worked at, on Dragon Age. And again, it was a really great time. I learned a lot. But, I mean, we didn't get used to the city and everything, so we ended up moving to San Diego. So I came to, to Sony to work as a supervisor at San Diego. And I, I learned a lot about faces because ba the studio in San Diego is mainly the technical support, I would say, like maybe technical support too, but a lot of the Sony studios. So in there, we, do, we did a lot of facial stuff for all the Sony games, a lot of scanning, so I learned a lot about that. I learned a lot about like facts, blend shapes, all that stuff. Was this for uh, Killzone? Then, yeah, I worked on Killzone, Infamous, The Order, what else? Because someone was asking as as relates to the kill zones, were they real people, um, and how did you guys tackle the expressions? Yeah, so those are real actors, but we characterize them on top of the of the scan and everything. Because this scan, like people think, people really think the scans are great, but it's not everything. Everything does not come from the scans. Because when you're scanning an actor for for a piece like that for an acting, we scan like maybe two hundred. Of, of scans and expressions and those scans are not really good it's just to have an overall shape of the expressions and everything and then we got those base scans and we finish the, the modeling add all those details characterize the characters on top of that and use the scans just to have a, a base of what the expressions look like mm -hmm. so, so yeah those are real actors cool and just then so after a, no, no, I was just gonna say. I was just gonna say. Uh, so I, I spent like a, a fourteen months, like a, a bit more than a year in San Diego, and I just moved to Santa Monica to work at Sony Santa Monica. Go ahead. Cool. No, that's great. Um, and in terms of, I think you know, um, one of the questions was in terms of a junior artist or someone just trying to break into the three D industry. Like, what advice would you have for them? Just really, just try to do as much as you can. I mean, at the beginning, it's really hard to, I mean, except if you're really talented and if you, I don't know, some people are just extremely talented. But for me, it was the opposite. I mean, just really work hard and try to, like, stuff like this, just try to get as much information as you can, try to learn what you want to do. Because in this, in this business, you can do a lot of stuff. I mean, you, you say work with characters, but you can, you can do statues, you can do cinematics, you can work for movies, you can work for games. So there's a lot of things you can do, and there are different pipelines for every single one of them. So just try to kind of know what you want to do and focus your portfolio on that, because that's going to just shorten the time for you to get a job. Because really, like, if you want to work at Sony Santa Monica, and like we do God of War, uh, so you got to have, like, if you really want to work there, or if you want to work at Blizzard, you got to have pieces that really shows that you want to work there. So just Focus your time on really what you want to do. It's gonna because there's a lot of people. And for me, at the beginning, I was just I didn't know what you, what I wanted to do. So my portfolio was like everywhere. I have cinematic characters. I have game characters. I have everything. And again, I was just learning, and I was just learning about myself, like what I want to do. So I mean, if you know what you want, and if you, for example, if you know you want to work at Blizzard, just do your stuff focused on Blizzard. I mean. Learn as much as you can, but just try to use your time the best way you can. And that's going to be very helpful in the future, just trust me. Yeah, I, I could definitely imagine. And I completely agree as it relates to tailoring your portfolio, your demo reel towards the companies that you want to apply for. Yeah, because Doing... this, this thing takes time. I, a lot of people think that, I mean, you can get a job real quick, but it really takes time. I mean, I've, I've been doing this for like 10 years. And I still have a lot of stuff to learn. So, yeah, just try to use your time the best way you can. No, definitely. Uh, what materials do you use when uh, sculpting and why? And I, and I assume this is more traditional sculpting. Yeah, I use a lot of, a lot of different materials. I mean, it's, if you're starting and if you want something easy to work with, just go with monster clay, which is a pretty cool clay. I mean, if you're in the U.S., you can get it very, very easily. And it's, I mean, 
it's pretty easy. I use a, a lot of different stuff. I use Sculpey if, if I want to do something that I want to paint afterwards. I can just bake it and paint. But it really, I don't know, tools, about tools, yeah, again, I don't use a lot of tools. I have maybe some dentist tools that I use. <laughs> but yeah, if, you, if you're not doing something huge, like a real light, like a real size scale, you don't need a lot of tools. You just buy some dentist. Just go to I mean, Dick and Blake and buy some, some tools. Cool, cool. So um, we have another question here. Uh, I've worked mostly, uh, this is from Greg, he's worked mostly as a concept designer, but there are very few concept artist positions compared to 3D artist positions. Um, he's asking, do you think that reinventing himself as a character artist is a good idea and would lead to more opportunities in this industry? If you think a concept artist, there's not a lot of positions. The character, it's, I think there's not a lot of positions. There's a lot of positions for environment artists, a lot of positions for, I don't know, lighting, but most mainly environment. The character, there's, you can maybe think it, there's a lot of positions in there, but it's really hard to get a job as a character artist if you don't have enough portfolio or if you don't have enough, enough experience. So, I don't know. It's really, it's, it's really about like what you like to do and what you love to do because that's going to drive your just just to move, you're gonna have more motivation to work on your stuff. So if you think you like like 3D stuff, if you like characters, I'll say just go for it because there is positions for people who has enough, who have enough experience and enough portfolio. But it's, it's really hard at the beginning. Don't think you're gonna get a job just because you, you think there's more positions. Because uh, I think it's the opposite. You gotta have a good portfolio as much as you gotta have if you're a concept artist. I completely agree. I think I think it's challenging uh, for both aspects of our industry. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're amazingly talented, such as yourself, um, I think you'll have a good opportunity or a great opportunity of getting in. Yeah. For so, sure. um, at work, do you ever get frustrated with a concept or a character uh, design? And if so, how do you deal with that? Imagine this yeah. is more like dealing with the art department and you know dealing with concepts and. Do you ever get frustrated think, with that? And how do you deal with it? I've, uh, maybe I can answer this just by my experience at all, because right now I don't have a lot of problems with the concept department. It's great. I mean, at work, it's just amazing. But I mean, it, it's been 10 years just to get to that. And so before, I, I had a lot of problems, especially when you're freelancing and when you don't have a concept. And I, you got to make keep making changes and variations and everything. And it's really hard when you're freelancing, but I don't know, when, usually when I'm inside of a studio, it's really, it's pretty cool, I mean, it, it's really what you think about, like, having some really talented people, concept artists, and working with them to create a character, it's just, it's just amazing, but before that, with freelance, yeah, it's the nightmare, kind of <laughs> heavy mind. Yeah, definitely. So on um, this question is, can you tell us which classes you're going to be teaching in CGMA? Uh, is it creature sculpting, zebras, human faces, or something completely different? Um, so, and I'll ask you know, um, ask part of uh, answer part of that question. Um, so, yeah. we're still developing a lot of the uh, more advanced classes, and this is where uh, you know Raphael and some of the more senior uh, um, character artists uh, that are part of our staff, you know, part of our instructors. Um, they're going to be coming in. So right now it's it's pretty early on. So the first few classes that we have as it relates to anatomy um, as well as intro to production modeling or creature anatomy um, are going to be one set of instructors. But as we get more advanced, that's where uh, Raphael would be able to contribute more. Right now as an advisor, he's helping us with, uh, you know, the, the development of the classes as, as, as it relates to what should be focused and uh, what should be covered based on his experience and his own workflow. Um, and also, he's going to be providing feedback to some of the more senior students as they make their way throughout the, uh, the program. Did you want to add to that, Raphael, or I think pretty good? Or? Yeah, no, I think that's pretty much it. I mean, I really like the, the, the content that you have so far, and I, I'm really looking forward to like, the future and uh, more senior so I can help more. And, of course, I'm just going to be creating a lot of content about for for like the workshops and talk about more anatomy and all this stuff. Exactly. Person. Perfect. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, and as I said, uh, guys, this is um, you know just to make use of his time and 
his experience um, in terms of what he's done, it's like it's better to focus on some more of the advanced character classes. So as the students make their way down um, through the pipeline, uh, through the program, as they get to some of the more involved um, aspects of character design, this is where Raphael would definitely come in and help uh, develop that more. So moving along, um, are there exercises that you do on daily or that you could recommend that would help improve uh, improve your skill set as an artist overall? Yeah, I do a lot of sketches. I mean, people don't see because I don't really share a lot of stuff that I do. But like, I do a lot of sketches, like daily sketches. Or if I think something is cool, like I don't know, if I if I want to learn new techniques. So I do like quick models or like some quick, very quick like sketches just to try techniques for, for example, hair. Like before I did the, for example, this thing right here. So before I went and just created the actual hair for this character, I made a quick test just with a sphere. So I mean if I don't have, like if I have some time at lunch, for example, and I can just mess with the hair, I can just play with this for a while before I do something more specific like this character. So yeah, something like that that you can just practice or do some sketches. It's really helpful and I do that a lot. People don't see it but I do it a lot, like really. And another thing is just sculpting. I mean when you're starting and that, that's something that really helped me. It's just by like getting a piece of clay and I'm talking about like traditional sculpture. Just by getting a piece of clay and, and trying to play with that, you see that it's gonna mess with your head if you never did that before like if you like let's say you model facing the ZBrush and then you get a piece of clay you're like what I do with this it's really gonna mess with your head and it's gonna force you to understand the shapes and understand what everything needs to be because in ZBrush you can really get rid of like you can get a base mesh and get pre ahead and skip some of the base stages of learning proportions learning how to really the step by step so really by getting a piece of clay and practice on that just it really helps you're gonna see the difference it's gonna like when you need to do something faster you're gonna see you're gonna really notice the difference because you know the step by step and you know how to block out the shapes and you know what the eye should be and I'm just talking about the face but that goes for everything like silhouettes proportions of the human body all the stuff really when you do the traditional sculpture it really helps a lot there's no shortcuts to clay yeah, it's no sh shortcuts to anything. <laughs> yeah, it's when no it comes symmetry. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, it helped me a lot. No, I great. Recommend it. Perfect. So do you, do you use a lot of uh, references um, when you're creating creatures? Yes, that's the most important thing in my pipeline, references. I, I know a lot of people, and I was, I was doing that when I, when I started. A lot of people have these kind of, I don't know, it's afraid of use reference because I don't know maybe you're not so creative or you're copying or I mean I want to be an artist or all that stuff and really like, I can use as much reference as, as I can and if I have a concept I literally just put my character on top of the concept and see what's wrong and what's changing and what's different proportion wise plus I use I have a lot of reference so in for making a creature the references are like the main Thing. like I do everything based on references so for for the raptor character for example for the mouth I just use a snake mouth as a reference and I just copy 100% what I had what the what the snake has and then I can change that on my own afterwards and then just make it more interesting but yeah references are the main main thing just don't be afraid of use references if you especially if you have a concept and if you're dealing with a client the client wants the concept if you're in the studio and the art director approved the concept, the art director wants the concept as a 3D character. They don't want you to, like, if that, if that was approved, they don't want you to do, go crazy and do something more cool because you think it's cool. So, yeah, just use the concept, use the reference, go, like, be very professional about that. Cool. No, I think uh, that's great advice. Um, so, uh, this uh, Joel, he's a 2D artist. I'm a, I'm a 2D artist looking to do more game concept, more game concept um, work. Uh, when you're often working from a 2D concept, what are the things a 2D concept artist can do to make your job easier? Well, we, I think, what we usually do is, do is just a bunch of sketches because we usually have like a main look that's approved, 
and then you can see there's a bunch of like explorations of the character, a bunch of sketches just to just to I don't know share the the same thoughts that you had for the character artist. So that's something that I really asked when when I'm working with a concept artist, and people really enjoy doing that just by sharing like explorations, sharing like poses, different poses, uh, different views of the character, and it doesn't need to be like a cool final image, just like a bunch of sketches really help. And yes, I think that's my favorite part of the job, just getting some rough sketches and by doing and doing something amazing out of that. Perfect. So we have another question here as it relates to uh, your um, T models and, uh, and, and T poses and in uh, ZBrush. Do you start your models in a T-pose and then pose them in ZBrush or just start posed? No, I always start with a T-pose and yeah, when I say T-pose, it's not like the the very extreme T-pose. It's kind of more relaxed, kind of still keeping the symmetry and, the, and everything but more relaxed pose. So yeah, I started, I sculpt with symmetry as much as I can and then after I'm done or if after if I think I can start breaking, especially on the face for, for, for that arc, the arc that I did, like this guy. So I used as, as much as I, I, I could the T-pose. Well, this guy, was, so you can see what I'm talking about, the T-pose. It's not with the arms, arms raised and everything. It's kind of of a basic pose, but it's not posed at all. And then at the end, when I'm done with sculpting and I want to start breaking those shapes, I can just lower more the arms and everything. So it's 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 a T pose but it's not the extreme extreme case. But if I'm working in a game studio, for example at Sony, we we need to have like a very kind of extreme T pose because the characters move a lot and have a lot of stuff happening. So yeah, we sculpt everything on T pose. And we, we do some exploration it's just like by like lowering the arms, just showing if everything's working. But the final mesh or the mesh that we work with most of the time is on the T-pose. Cool. Great. Um, so can you share uh, really quickly how you broke up the mouth or you opened the mouth for the uh, raptor creature? Because before you had it closed and then you were able to just open that. So if you could just quickly share that workflow. Yeah. So I have, I have three layers here. One with the mouth open, one with the mouth closed. So you can see here it's changing. And then I'm not going to touch those layers anymore. And then I have the secondary shapes, which this layer right here is the layer that I'm going to work with. So everything that I do on this layer is going to propagate to those two layers, mouth open and mouth close. So yeah, I have these two layers that I can turn on and off every, any, anytime. And then I have this layer that I'm going to just do the details. So they were just sculpted separately, correct? They were, Ra Raphael? Like before, yeah, before I did the remesh, so this mm -hmm. is the remesh, I come here and, and I create those layers. So I have these. So the way that I sculpt it and remesh it was with the mouth like a little bit open. Mm -hmm. So I can still have some of the topology inside. And then I have those two layers which were sculpted yeah, in ZBrush just by masking the mouth and then closing the mouth with mm -hmm. the transpose. And then, and then yeah, the third layer is just for, for just keep adding those details. So everything was like all those details were done in the, in the third layer, and then I still had those two initial states mm -hmm. that I can close and open. Cool. Makes sense. Um, so Kevin asks, do you think it's best to generalize or specialize in modeling, animation, or rigging? I think at the beginning you have to generalize and learn everything. Mm -hmm. Even if it's the base, you got to be able to know how to... Like, you, you need to learn how to the animator work and how the rigger works. So when you're creating your character, you know what's going to come down further in the pipeline. So yeah, at the beginning, just go with everything and learn as much as you can. Because especially at the beginning, maybe you, you find yourself liking animation more than, than, than modeling. And that's what happened to me. Like I was started, I started well, I was really into animation. And then a couple of years, Later, I was just, uh, I want to do characters and I want to model, so then I just migrate to, to modeling. So yeah, at the beginning, just go with everything, learn as much as you can. That's why I recommend just go to, go to school and just, I don't know, do a lot of workshops, DVDs. Just learn as much as you can, and then when you know what you want to do, just go with, just specialize on modeling or 
rigging or whatever you like more. No, definitely. I completely agree. This is one of the questions that we've, you know, we have throughout, uh, we've had throughout this session, um, and it's pretty straightforward, but um, I want you to uh, answer it, which is, uh, what's better for, uh, for modeling, 3D Studio Max or Maya? <laughs> it's a, it's a cr tricky question because I use Max. I've used Max for I don't know eight years, and I just I started use Maya because at Sony we use Maya, and I don't know. Still, I like Max better, but at the end of the day, Maya. I think it doesn't matter. It's like it yeah. has. It's up to you, and you just have to create amazing art, yeah. right? Yeah, for it's sure. Like, so it's like whether it's sculpting or ZBrush or Mudbox. It's like at the end of the day, it's just you as an artist being able to create amazing stuff. Yep. No matter what software you're using. Exactly. Perfect. So, but um, uh, so it looks like we're approaching. We actually are over about eight minutes or so, and we still have a bunch uh, of questions to go. Um, we're probably going to have to do a part two to this uh, much later on when uh, Raphael's uh, schedule clears up. Um, but before we go, we uh, want to take just uh, one last question, um, and this is from Olivier who asks. Uh, anatomy is a big part of your workflow. How did you learn it, and would would you suggest uh, um, to improve this skill? Yeah, I, I guess that's come that everything that I said an answers that. Like sketches, play, everything helped, and just by having those small, like small studies and like getting an arm, for example. Just I want to learn. Um, like my arm is not. Not my arm. <laughs> the arms of, of my characters is not great. I mean, the forearm. I can see. I can improve that. So don't let. Don't try to do your best forearm when you're making a character. Just go ahead and grab a piece of dye mesh, a piece of clay, and just do the best forearm that you can. So then that's what I did. And then when you when you go to make a character or make something for your portfolio, like something final, you're gonna you know you're gonna know how to make a forearm. And that's gonna show, right? Instead of just trying to do like a full anatomy or like like a naked character, like a crazy anatomy and everything. Just do small studies. Do like uh, that's what I did. Just I did a lot of small studies. I did a lot of studies in clay, like just using a lot of reference, trying to replicate those references. Because the thing about anatomy, it's not really learning about like the name of the muscle or uh, where that muscle starts, where that muscle like ends, all that stuff. It's really about looking at an image and trying to like interpret shadows and interpret shapes and see what's happening so you can replicate that into your, into your character. So it's really about like getting references, get a lot of bodybuilding references, a lot of skinny guys, skinny like everything related to anatomy and trying to replicate that. Just do a lot of small sketches and that's what I did. Drawing Perfect. like this like a little drawing that I that I that I've done in those years, it's all anatomy. I have like a sketchbook with anatomy stuff because I don't have to create. I don't have. I just basically I'm just copying stuff because anatomy is just basically copying what's out there. No, I think that's great. Well, guys, uh, first off, I'd like to just uh, thank you, thank Ralph for just uh, Raphael Grissetti for this amazing uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Raphael, for taking time to do this. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, uh, you know, for all the questions. And once again, we're really sorry for, uh, you know, uh, those of you we didn't get around to answering some of your questions. As said, we'll try to do another one uh, for part two.